If you start at Alaska's coastline, turn around and drive into the interior. If you keep driving as far as you can, you just might find somewhere deep in the wilderness of the Kenai Peninsula. There's a tiny little A-frame cabin. At first glance, you might think it looks cute. Oh man, that is a cute cabin, my goodness. You might think you and your family would enjoy living here off-grid. All right, we arrived at the cabin for the first time. Yeah, let's go see Let's it. go see the cabin. You might think you were tough enough for this. We can do this, we can have an off-grid experience, but you might be wrong. This is pretty bad, it's pretty harsh here. I was a little depressed about it. So it's just harder work in a different place. Everything is harder here. <laughs> Everything. Doing dishes is harder, cooking is harder, making sure all the kids are comfortable is harder, which just means there is not a moment to rest. We thought our family was tough enough to live rustic off-grid in Alaska, but the dreaded A-frame. Just two weeks living in this tiny rustic A-frame was all it took our family was ready to leave. And we did. We went and stayed in bigger off-grid cabins. We stayed in cabins with better amenities. The plan for this was we were gonna do a sauna session. We saw how other people in Alaska lived off-grid, what technologies they incorporated to make their lives yeah, let's, easier. Let's head on in. We've learned so much living off-grid in Alaska. And now we were coming back back to the dreaded A-frame to see if maybe now, maybe now we had what it takes. Could our family make rustic, remote wilderness life off-grid in Alaska's Kenai wilderness something we could enjoy? This episode of the Alaska Off-Grid Challenge is called The Return. This was, this was, what? This was barren. Yeah. This, okay. Look at all the grass. Hey, our tarp's still up. Yeah, it is still up. Yeah. Hey, come no on. No house! Oh, you see the bubble. After, uh, after journeying throughout oh, all of Alaska please. and staying in all kinds of places, <laughs> Back at the A-frame. We'd gone through a lot of really tough challenges our early days off-grid at this A-frame. And honestly, our feelings were mixed arriving back. How do you feel being back at the A-frame? <laughs> Fine. Fine. When we left the A-frame earlier this summer to stay in the other off-grid cabins in Alaska, we left a lot of our stuff there. So the kids were excited to get back to their toys. How do you feel being back at the A-frame? Slime. Happy to see your slime? Yes. All right, who's taking a bath? Me. After a long day of traveling and unpacking the car, Kay and I were both looking forward to taking a slow, hot bath out in the Kenai wilderness. But the A-frame, of course, had other plans. Yeah, the nostalgia's wearing off for me pretty quickly. I can't get our hot water system working. For some reason, I can't get our instant hot water heater to light. And uh, that was one of the things we were most looking forward to coming back here, was like, well, at least we'll have a nice on-demand hot bath. But it's not working, I have to figure out why. It won't light, so. Doesn't help either that the mosquitoes are out in droves right now and like troubleshooting while being eaten alive. It's just a, an obnoxious combo. Ooh, that should help. All right, let's go fix our hot water problem. Batteries. Let's see what, we're an airlock. This was by no means the first time something broke at the dreaded A-frame. If you've been watching this series from the beginning, then you've seen many, many things not working upon arrival 
or quickly breaking after being here. I can't get that water working. The problems at the A-frame seem to compound one on top of another. And this, this is why. Because that's all our stuff. Whether you were trying to cook a meal or fix a broken water heater, the supplies you needed to get the job done were somewhere in there. Good luck finding them. Our broken water heater, well, I needed to open it up and get inside, and that required about three different tools I couldn't find. I need the paper towel. Oh, they're not in here yet. Yeah, instantly, I'm stressed out. You didn't guess yet. Do you want to guess? Oh, I'll guess. Okay. <laughs> Did you want to tell us why you were stressed? Did you guess yet? Uh, lack of organization. Lack of space to put anything. There's no room. Of all the places that we'd stayed off grid, this cabin was the smallest and the most rustic, and it was seriously hard for our life not to just be a complete mess. I know that looks awful. I swear, we would clean it daily. I have the time lapses to prove it, but just hours later, it would look like this again. Why? There was a fundamental problem. What's our problem? Tell us. Our problem is we just don't have enough space. We have so much stuff in here that, and very, very limited storage that we're just, it's a disaster. Yeah, it stresses me out to live in a place like this, so I've got to get a handle on it. If we were gonna last the rest of the summer living off-grid as a family in the dreaded A-frame, we were going to need some help. And we knew just who could help us. We'd visited a farmer's market. We'd met a lot of wonderful people there. One of them was Allison, who worked at a farm in Homer, Alaska. Her and her husband, Preston, lived in a place they called Tiny Land. It was a completely off-grid homestead made up of many different buildings, all under 200 square feet. They invited the whole family to come and check out Tiny Land. Come on over to Tiny Land. You can see, mm. walk through. Um, the space here. And they promised to share some advice that would help anybody trying to live a successful life off-grid in a tiny space. We had to go to Tiny Land. <laughs> okay, go ahead. <laughs> Shoes off, get your muddy boots off. Take turns. It's like a clown car with my thing. This is called a tiny home, guys. What do you think? Can we fit in this? Oh, goodness. Yeah, no, we um, definitely did everything. We, were come, we wanted to come to Alaska basically to do this, to find land and then... Um, yeah, that was the goal, was to kind of homestead and then it kind of evolved. We did, yeah, we moved up here with the intent to like buy land, build a house, put the garden in, raise the chickens, like all that stuff was like the goal. And when we were driving up here, you were like, I want to be a farmer. And I was like, I want to be a carpenter. Nice. And we both worked in hospitality before I was a chef. Allison was a server. Oh, okay. Yeah. And we were just sort of over that lifestyle, you know, staying up late. Just, it's just hard, you know? And we were like, let's just totally change. We'll go to Alaska, farming, carpentry. We were just going to do a summer. Yeah. We were kind of doing seasonal work. We're like, we'll do a summer there and we'll hop down and do a ski season somewhere. You know, we thought we'd be just bouncing around doing yeah. seasonal work. And then once we got here, we just, like yeah nine, nine years, years ago nine, so you've been now here in alaska for nine years mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and at that point in time like we didn't really we had some money that was saved up and we were wanting to we kind of 
did a little bit differently than I say some people do where they would purchase land and then build a house. We were kind of like, well, let's build our house and then we can rent, you know, find a place land that we can rent until we save up enough money to then buy land. Cause it was like, if we use our savings and everything to then buy land, then we don't really, we wouldn't have enough to actually yeah, build. To build, to build yeah. And so to start the business, we're like, let's just, let's build a house, let's build our house. And then that can kind of jump start Tiny Homer. The tiny that's house where... things came first for sure. That's where we like came up with the idea for Tiny Homer and like we're like this will get us out of rent and you know all the things that we wanted to do with the tiny house. Yeah, we're like we should just start a tiny house business. What specifically or... about that uh appealed to you? Oh, just like the simplicity of the lifestyle kind of or I don't know, just like fitting everything into a small space kind of appealed to me, I guess and and when I was younger, I did a lot of like traveling and I had built out a camper in my pickup truck and then I had a van. So yeah, I was always kind of into like the small space living and we were both in these little tree houses in the islands. So yeah, we're just kind of into small spaces. And, <laughs> like, yeah. They are definitely into small spaces and you can tell they're really good at what they do. Preston and Allison make the most of every inch in every tiny building that they work on. We knew we had come to the right place. It's super interesting. It like, a, all the storage up high, high, you don't see it when you walk in. It doesn't so feel when cluttered. You, it doesn't feel cluttered, no. It's unbelievable, right? Like, you have everything that you need in a very small space. Oh, yeah, there's a little light switch right underneath. Right, yeah, right behind you, hit that little button. Wow. Look at that! So cool! So nice. Oh, and this is the I first one you guys made. First one. Tiny, that's the name of their home, 125 square feet. And yet even in that small space, it was very organized, didn't feel cluttered. But Preston and Allison told us it wasn't always this way. In the early days, tiny life was much more challenging for them. It's completely DIY and we're also um, been kind of doing it out of pocket. We've been working on it in stages. Moving into a small space, a construction zone small space is really, really hard and we know we did it. Yeah, we know from oh, experience. You guys moved in to here. Yeah. We moved in here in winter, middle winter in Alaska with with no heat, no insulation. Oh man. Yeah, it was Fair. Bare, just bare framing in here and it was, we were so excited. We were so excited to come back and move in. We had maybe spent like a night in here and so it was like our first, like really we're moving in. And it was shifting from like construction zone to dinner and then the oh, bed man. in like 125 yeah. square feet. It's really hard. We, I mean, we even had, we had all sorts of things. We had our kitchen out on the, out on the deck. We had a pallet out in the field with a tarp over it with our stuff. All of our clothes were in like totes <laughs> so then we'd have to like, tarp. Oh, man. And I was like so good there for a while. I'd be like, oh, you need the... Spatula? Sp <laughs> Whatever. So the blue tote all the way on the right. And then that all just like... <laughs> Eventually he lose all capacity to keep track of where all everything that is. You the know. mental space for that. That disorganized mess, living out of totes, not knowing where anything is. It sounded really familiar. But obviously something has changed. Preston and Allison figured out how to make Tiny Life successful. I wanted to know how. I was a chef before we moved here. And there's a term in cooking called mise en place and it means something like everything in its place. In the tiny house, everything needs to be in its place. And you know, it's not just important in the kitchen, it's important in the whole house. And you use something, put it back and like, very important to be organized and, and put things in their place. So. Yeah, it's, I'd like to think of that term from the culinary world and how that is incorporated into the, kind of the tiny house world too. So Applying the principle of mise en place to the tiny home made a huge difference in their life. But they still couldn't fit everything they needed or owned into this tiny square footage. So what did they do? Preston and Allison had two other great tips on how to make sure you make the best use of your space and still have access to all the things you need even when you're living tiny. Uh, I just thought maybe we'd mention the deck real quick. Uh, with the planning stage of the tiny house, it's good to think about outdoor space because when you're in a smaller space, you end up spending time outdoors and 
this deck has been a game changer for us. So just when you're thinking about it, whether it's a yard or a patio or a garden or something, some some way to kind of flow from outdoors to indoors. And that's that's another thing that we like to think about with the plan is you'll notice this covered entryway. We, we try to incorporate some kind of little covered entryway in all of our designs. Uh, we really try to talk people into that if we can, just because it's a nice, that too, it's a kind of the, a break between the outside world and the inside world. And, and we like to think of it as like the house kind of giving you a hug, you know, like you want to feel welcome. Do you want to feel like you can duck under here and, you know, set your groceries down and, and get the keys out and go in. Um, and you're not getting totally covered with rain, even if it's just this, I mean, this is two feet, but whatever you can get, if you can cover your front door and make it feel welcoming and like you want to come in, I feel like we see these tiny houses and it's like a shed roof right down onto the door and like two steps up and it just doesn't feel welcoming and inviting. So, and that, you know, think about where your snow is going to land and stuff too, but yeah. That is a great tip. I haven't heard that anywhere. Yeah, but, we've done plenty of cooking out here too. But and we cooked well back before the tiny house was done. We yeah, we had this whole crazy setup with like the Coleman stove out here. Oh yeah, teetered on some stuff, and we passed the dishes through the window mm -hmm. and right. Yep. But yeah, we and we now we cook out here too. You know, on the grill or we'll fry if we're gonna deep fry fish or something. We'll fry. Ah uh, so. yes, yeah. But yeah, outdoor space is nice. So Beautiful just kind of yeah, ex it expands the living. Space. Yeah, having people over to eat too. We always sit outside. If it's nice, we'll sit outside and eat. It's a heck of a view from the deck too. My goodness, man, you I guys know. got a good spot. A beautiful tiny home with everything in its place, and a deck that you can sit and enjoy your surroundings. But that was just a start. There's a lot more tiny buildings in Tinyland, and we wanted to see them all. Really, really cute. Oh, this is beautiful. They have so much solar power. Wow. Lights for fun. <laughs> it, it's so it is so Yes. Look. Look. Wow. That yeah. is a nice outhouse. My goodness. Wow. And we've stayed at a few different off. That's the best I've ever seen. That's the nicest, right? The nicest outhouse. Throughout the woods, you'll find many other tiny buildings in Tiny Land. Outhouses, saunas, guest spaces, workshops, even a chicken coop. So what yeah. is this little building for? Is it like Airbnb or something? Well, um, it's kind of just a little guest room now. You know, we don't have any room for guests in the tiny house. Yeah. All that, But in here we got a twin bed and this was going to be a woodshed and then it started to get nicer. And <laughs> my sister was coming to visit. I'm like, hey, you can stay in the woodshed. And she's like, no, I'll, just pitch, I'll pitch the tent. I'm like, no, the woodshed's kind of nice. So it turned into just like a guest bedroom and now we use it for like what, yoga and... Yeah. yeah, just like a somewhere to stretch. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so oh man, look at that. Oh wow, look at this. This is like. When oh, Preston home. and Allison decided to build this off-grid tiny life, they did not want to go into debt, and so they started with just a very tiny home. But over time, not being in debt, they've been able to put aside money to expand their living space through these additional tiny buildings. Yeah, so the tiny house journey, I guess. We found the land, got settled in, tweaked things around, made some changes along the way, but um, yeah, like the more the, the tiny house finished out, the, the more time was freed up and needs came up and the, you know, the outbuildings came and yeah, the lifestyle kind of evolved and it all started with that first first house. It allowed us to, to get to this point, which, you know, we feel very fortunate to be where we are. So Back home, yeah. you don't see a lot of like, oh, well, we built a cabin and then an outhouse and then this. Why do we see this so much in Alaska? What did it, why was it good for you guys to be able to do first the home and then all the other little buildings? I wonder if it has something to do with the extremes of the environment here. Like a small space is easier to heat, you know, so maybe just get the little cabin up real quick, get the wood stove in there cranking and then and then as you need, they sort of expand. That's a theory maybe, but it just worked well for us because yeah, the mobility of the tiny house allowed us to get the, to own the house before we own the land. And then once we own the land, you know, we kind of put tiny on a more of a permanent pad and foundation, and then we could sort of grow from there. So for us, yeah, it was just key to be able to build the house before we had the land. And now that we have the land, yeah, 
we want the bathhouse and the guest cabin and all the stuff. So you kind of you kind of root in a little bit more. Yeah, you know, and you, you're and you, just like you're needing a little bit more things like our gear shed for you yeah. know we started like getting a couple more pairs of skis, <laughs> you know, a few things, a couple snow machines. Well, that's so. another commonality <laughs> around here is people tend to have a lot of stuff. I don't know if you've noticed uh, yards yeah. around here, but yeah, a, a lot of Alaska I see it's like runners, right? It's like that you yeah. plant, plant your first strawberry or raspberry. And you get that established yeah. and rooted, and then boop, out goes the outhouse, and or well, usually the outhouse is first, yeah. and then boop, out goes this building, and then you got a shed, and then you got a sauna, and then yeah. the the guest cabin. You start small, and then you have a little bit of free income, and you build a little another, yeah. So much of the traditional way of like the American dream is shown where, well, you get the car so you can have credit and then you take the credit and you apply for the loan for the big house and you get the better job and then the bigger house. Instead of that way, avoid the debt, avoid the, right, avoid the, the slavery of the debt, do what you can afford, and then you can afford more and do a little bit more. And I see this beautiful life you guys have built, DIY, self-funded, and uh, you know, it's just, it's an awesome example. There's a lot of excuses people have why they can't do something. This is a great example of how you can do something. So thank Definitely. you guys so much for sharing. Yeah. Yeah. Your story is uh, inspirational, it's beautiful, and uh, somebody watching this is gonna wind up growing their own uh, strawberry runners out from uh, some <laughs> tiny cabin. Yeah. Thank cool. you so much. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you. If you're interested in tiny life, Preston and Allison have a business, Tiny Homer. They can build you a tiny home or they can walk you through the process of planning and building your own. I'll have links in the description below so you can get a hold of Tiny Homer. And if you're a homesteady pioneer, we have an extended version of this interview. It is full of information. It was about an hour and a half long discussion we had about tiny life. They showed us all sorts of tricks of the trade. Uh, we call these blueies. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but this was like a little invention. I had Even an awesome way that they got a lot of free building materials. So that's kind of how we got a lot of our materials. All of the cedar that you see everywhere, like the siding too, was all from a smokehouse in Happy Valley. This is a great, great tip here. Click in the link below to watch the extended version of that. If you're not a pioneer, click the link below to become one. We were so glad we had visited Tiny Land. We learned some really key principles to tiny living that were gonna help us out big time back at our tiny off-grid cabin. Mise en place, everything in its place. Making the most of your outdoor space and using outbuildings to increase your square footage, your living space, and storage. These three principles were going to be game changers back at the dreaded A-frame. We came to Alaska to learn about off-grid life. And see, and see if we could do it as a family. Alaska is the land of the off-gridders. So many people live in tiny cabins off-grid. We've been fortunate enough to talk to a lot of them on our journey here and get some really good advice about how to make off-grid tiny life work for your family. Advice is only helpful if you put it into action. Today, it's time to start taking action, turning the dreaded A-frame into something that would work for us talked about how important it is to have a space that's separate from your living area, your cabin, where you store things you don't need, tools, equipment, stuff that you want to have on site but shouldn't be in this tiny little space of yours. So we need a shop space, but we don't have a shop belt. <laughs> that's okay, I have a pretty good idea of what we could use for a shop while we're here off-grid in Alaska. Moose tracks. Look at that, right here. A moose must have blown that down. Look at the moose tracks right here. Wow. We hope to see a moose here, Daddy. We hope to see a moose. Right, right here, a moose ran through. You can see right there, a moose ran through, probably tripped through our cable there and busted it. I got the tent fixed. We actually brought this tent because we knew we were gonna be traveling through Alaska and at times we might need a place to sleep. But 
we're not really using it here at the off-grid cabin and it's waterproof it stays up in the wind and the rain it'd be a great place to have a temporary shop where we store things long term put our tools keep all the stuff that we don't need in the cabin that way giving us much more space in the cabins with the extra storage space of the tent shop, now we would have more room in the cabin to put things in their place. Mise en place. Next up is this whole double life I'm living, kitchen-wise. The big bulk stuff, I'm not going through that much sugar or flour. That was uh, um, optimistic thinking of how much I was gonna bake with no oven. That's gonna get put in the staging area. I'm gonna keep small containers up here of flour and sugar. Anything big is going to go down to what we're calling the shop. Anything I use every day in the kitchen is going to go outside in the actual kitchen. And that'll free up a lot of space in here for all of this. <laughs> what do you think? Oh, I think it's a great idea. The inside of the cabin was cleaning up nicely and already it was feeling like we had more usable space. But this cabin is still 300 square feet. It's still very limited. But when touring Tiny Land, we saw the importance of maximizing the use of your outdoor space. We had a lot of work to do on our deck. We're gonna do a complete outdoor kitchen now, which means we have to improve this space. We need some like counter it's space. It's gonna be a lot more usable and I'd love the cooler to be out of the sun. That's gotten full sun all day. <laughs> Nothing like wasting find, your refrigerator. Yeah, maybe put the cooler on the, In the shade. Side. Get a table here, I'm thinking. You want a table across the back. Yeah. This has tools in it because um, we were working on the house so much we put all the tools in it. But we're not working on the house now. There's no reason to have our tools so this close. So let's take all the tools down to, to the, the shop. shop. Okay, let's do it. It's a beautiful day in Alaska, which means it's a buggy day in Alaska. And now me and blob child number one is going to uh, work on getting this taken care of. Should be fun. You ready, blob child? <laughs> Maybe it's not even one of my kids. Maybe it's Sasquatch. Oh, Look at these. Get these are pants. Uh, pants. Wow, that's really dramatic. Huh? Ooh. side. One thing we learned from Preston and Allison was to take advantage of scraps. They had entire buildings at Tiny Land that were built out of pallets, out of scrap lumber, out of old building materials that were from one house they tore down and then used in a new one. We found a pile of scrap lumber that was on the property that had been saved. There were a lot of nails in it and screws in it, but with a little bit of time, we figured we could take this lumber and turn it into something we really needed big kitchen workspace. Okay, the big table is done. It's a pretty solid working space and uh, way more room to work outside in the kitchen. There's under space so we can store the cooler under there and other dry goods and it's all under the tarp so everything will stay dry. The sink is there. It's now a big working L and a big, oh mosquitoes. Okay, Super fun idea. My mom also sent these uh, nets, mosquito nets, which are supposed to go over your bed. But it's not really bad inside the cabin. It's really bad in this outdoor cooking kitchen space. I'm gonna try to ex attach this so it covers the whole outdoor kitchen and cuts down <laughs> on all those mosquitoes you see flying right there. See if it works. It would be amazing if it would work. It's a concept. What do you think? Concept. I wanted to see if it's worth investing time in. Is this one? Two? Yeah, we have like four of them. We oh, could wow. 
I think we could get it tight to all the grommets like yeah. this, like that. I mean, it would be better than tight there. what it is now, for sure. There'd still be cracks, but at least it would prevent a lot. What do you think? Worth the investment of time? I think so. I think so, too. <laughs> And I'd say, huh? Pretty nice. That is a resounding success. Yes. Outdoor kitchen. You can take off your. Ooh, do I dare? They're not perfect. Mosquitoes will still get through, but so much less will get through, which will allow us to spend more time cooking and less time swatting at bugs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which uh, I can feel already, us working in here, there's a lot less bugs. Yeah, I haven't had I, any. I could take my sweet get up off and I would not mind doing that so um, so yeah we got a nice work space it's not beautiful it's not Instagram but it's not itchy it's not rainy and we'll have so much more space inside this is going to be such an upgrade blockage from bugs this is becoming a much more usable user-friendly outdoor kitchen which will free up so much inside space oh we're getting there we're getting there We did it! Yay. Look at this beautiful outdoor kitchen. Huge improvement. Yes. Uh, so many things about this. Number one improvement for you? Oh, for me, mosquito net. Mosquito net. If there were 10 mosquitoes before, Ooh. there's one. Yeah. There's, there's, there's some holes, it's not perfect. But, but I mean, it really it's so much better. You, My your... favorite, space. <laughs> I got a lot of favorites now. Space inside the cabin for the kids to put Play-Doh and stuff up off the floor. So the baby's not getting into all their stuff. Outdoor having prep space to set stuff. And also having all the kitchen stuff all out In one here. place. So before it was like, I need salt, go and grab the salt. Door open, door shut, door open. Bugs in, bugs out. Shoes on, shoes off, awful. Good storage underneath, yes. right? We have dry goods. Cooler. Cooler full of all, that's our refrigerator. Okay. Pots and pans and stuff. And then our hot water heaters set up there for our instant hot water. Then over here we have our spices, silverware. The cabin that we're in is, I have to still measure it, but it's roughly about 300 square feet. It's really, really tiny. This is probably a- it Like a hundred square feet. Yeah, so it literally has added a, like a third quarter, of our... a third of what we've been doing, we now have a whole nother third of space that where before it was like half, eh, this is very usable. And I mean, this is with scrap lumber on a pair of horses. I feel like for a lot of people's off-grid dreams, not everybody, and I don't know that we would recommend doing it this way, but I think for a lot of people, this is the kind of thing that's gonna make dreams happen, right? Starting with whatever you can, and. It could building be an up RV or a mobile home yeah. kind of thing. Inexpensive, small, build your spaces out from there. Right, imagine you're living in a, a RV and you're going crazy and then you create a little cooking Outdoor gazebo. It, this has made such a huge difference you know, in the morale. Yes. You know, just knowing where things go, making it easy to see where a thing goes and it's, you know, close and easy to replicate. Right. It'll keep it cleaner. <laughs> And, and now that's true that's a good point because then everybody can participate in the the helping to put things away but this has made such a big difference we had an awesome kitchen now we needed something to make a really special meal and i had just the idea of what we could get for our very first special meal in our renovated off-grid cabin
We'd been in Alaska a long time now, and we still were yet to catch ourselves an Alaskan salmon. But at this point, we had spent a lot of time at the fishing hole. And while at the fishing hole, we'd been paying attention to who was catching salmon and what they were doing. We decided to change up how we were fishing, emulate the tactics of the locals who were being successful, and see if we couldn't put our first Alaska salmon on the table. After weeks and weeks of trying, we finally had a hit. Yeah, buddy. That's good, he's gonna run. Just let him wear out. Keep your line up in the air. Make sure he can run. Just focus. Focus on the fish. That's a good one too. He's fighting. Keep that line tight. Is that your fish? Whoa, whoa. Try to get him in that deep hole. Man, that thing is hauling. Turns out this salmon was snagged, which meant on this particular day, we would have to let him go. And that actually happens a lot in Alaska because of the amount of fish in the water at one time. But it was just the start of our good day of fishing. It's up. You got it. Look at that beauty, buddy. All right, buddy, hold your rock tip up. Get a video. Oh, wow, that one's fighting good. Over here, I need to film that. Whoa, wow. That thing's fitting on the shelf. I love taking my kids fishing, and nothing makes a day of fishing more perfect than everybody catching a fish. Could we do it? Could we get everybody an Alaska salmon? I had two to go. Let's see. You got one, honey! You got one! Look at that! You got a big old salmon! What's your catch today, Salmon. You got one? When my last sudden pole went off, it looked like we were gonna get every kid a fish. But this... Oh my... This was the biggest salmon we'd seen yet, and it was on a pretty small pole. Could he do it? Could he get it to the shore? That's a giant one. Keep it up high. Keep it up. Don't let it slack. Don't let it have slack. Don't let it have any slack. Keep it up high. Yes! 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 Holy, Holy what? That's a giant! <laughs> You got one. That thing is beautiful. No, it's all Every kid caught a salmon. 
I've had a lot of good days of fishing, but this, this was in the top three of my entire life. We were a little excited. Daddy, we don't have a bridge to go. With our cooler full of salmon and our spirits high, we headed back to the A-frame to break in our new kitchen. So today, this big girl caught a wild Alaskan salmon. How was the fight? Good. How'd you catch it? I didn't even catch it out very far in the middle. Mm-hmm. I did the wet. Alaskan salmon caught. Mmm. Mm. Thank you. Oh my goodness. Look at the color. Carnivores. That is wild. That color does not come from dye. That color comes from the fish's diet, actually. Mm. Oh my goodness. Mm. Can we sit down? Yeah, let's sit down and enjoy this. This is. Yeah, well, anybody who would like to eat this. Line down the middle, don't okay, so here's a, a little Alaska. This is like an Alaskan delicacy I'm having here. I have fresh caught salmon, and what I've done, Kay's idea, we took some late run Alaska birch syrup, which is like that's like a $30 bottle right there. So it is a delicacy. Split it with a little bit of soy sauce to make like a uh, fancy Alaskan teriyaki. Holy yum. Oh my goodness. Alaskan yaki? Mm. I'm gonna see how your so sauce good. is. He lets me steal it if I do it on camera, so. <laughs> I'll do it. Mm. That's really good. Mm -hmm. Better than yours? That's like instant, instant teriyaki. Oh my goodness, this is so good. Should I cook it more? What do you think, kiddo? Take a bite of your salmon, tell me what you think. I'm gonna try it all together. It's my daughter's custom take on fish and chips. It's a trademark recipe. Mm. So good. Oh my goodness, I have to move to Alaska. Touring tiny land, learning these principles of tiny living, and then applying them back at the dreaded A-frame, they made a huge difference. We were more organized, we could find the things we needed, and we had more space that we could enjoy living at the A-frame. But those weren't the only changes that made life better at the Dreaded A-frame. We had changed. When we first came to Alaska, we had zero off-grid experience. But now, well now we had spent months living in different off-grid cabins, we had learned from different off-grid experts, we had real experience, we were tougher than we were when we first arrived. In the final weeks of our off-grid adventure, life at the A-frame was very different. Loud, boisterous. For the very first time since we'd arrived in Alaska, rustic, tiny living, we were doing a pretty good job at it. 
we've done it. I mean, look at how fit. Look at your chicken. That looks like chef, chef made chicken. That looks great. Nice crispy skin. Saute in so nicely. And <laughs> my nice chicken sauce. Yeah, a little gravy. We had chicken and dumplings yesterday. We did. You've been happy, huh? We were smiling a lot more. We were having a good time. And the cabin? Well, it didn't actually feel like the dreaded A-frame anymore. It felt kind of like home. I feel like the cabin's become a nice, home. we call it home, right? At the end of a long day, we say we like, We want to be home. I'm already missing this. I'm already missing it. You're mourning. I know, we're getting close to being done here. And like, I used to drive down that driveway with nervous energy. Now I feel like uh, bittersweet. We had taken up the off-grid challenge to see if our family could handle rustic, off-grid, tiny living. And finally, after lots of ups and downs, it seemed like we could. So then why, at the very end of this challenge, did we feel like this? I feel a little bad right now. <laughs> okay, I missed another shot. So, like, off the grid didn't solve that for me. No. Not, like, there's got to be a balance somewhere. We finish up the summer at the cabin. We leave Alaska. No longer with the goal of living off grid. Find out why in the conclusion of the Alaska off grid challenge. Click here to watch that. The Alaska Off Grid Challenge is a series. If you've missed the beginning of this adventure, click here to go back and watch from the beginning.